It was a sale that went more than a billion dollars over its estimate and it has local Liberal MPs ready to ask for more. We're all working very hard on the Premier to have that topped up. We might even be trying to squeeze a little more out of the lemon, I would hope. But it's left the opposition with a sour taste as they open fire on the New South Wales Premier. What an insult. Why is it that the port of Newcastle can be sold for a mozza, but he gives to the hunter only a pittance? Also questioning the inflated sale of the port by drawing comparisons to the sale of another. When Port Botany was sold, mysteriously, a few weeks later, land usages were changed, building heights were rezoned and environmental controls were removed. It means now that the new port operator can set any charges without having to justify them to anyone at all. The sale has also prompted a call for funds to be distributed further up the Hunter Valley. We would love to see some of the proceeds from that port sale spent further abroad than, you know, further west of the Hexham Bridge. We need to be looking at big scale projects right across the Hunter. The Hunter's much bigger than the Newcastle CBD. But there's still hope that the treasure chest will open again. Each of us have a wish list that we each put in at the beginning of this year and a lot of those things that we added into our wish lists uh, were based on us achieving a better result for the lease of the port than was initially announced. Michael Kane, NBN News. Russell Baker has a heart of gold. A simple yet generous gesture 13 years ago paved the way for today's celebration. Just a feeling I had myself that there were a lot of people who were lonely and uh, perhaps I needed to t talk to somebody. So I just went and opened the church and uh, put the kettle on and, and got some bickies and, and some nicies and, and just got uh, let people come. Ken Lawrence then jumped on board and in 2007 the initiative grew with lunch served every Friday by the duo and several other volunteers at the Salvation Army's Newcastle Worship Community Centre. And what do you get out of it? Satisfaction. Um, satisfaction that um, I get an opportunity to help people. Here they seem to have that friendship that's uh, very deep and uh, uh, they all say it's the best place they ever go to. It's the fellowship and the friendship, meeting of other people, uh, just a general talk about the week's events, good Friday atmosphere. And every year the need and response by volunteers grows. They're now serving four times the initial number of people. 20,000 meals is quite a lot when you think of uh, the number of people that have been involved in that and the number of people that have passed through our doors in um, the past seven years. It's just a blessing that it's happened that way mm. and I think it'll keep doing that way. Emma Murphy, NBN News. A unique three days of all things farming giving many an outdoor agricultural lesson. It's more than a commercial trade fair, it's, it's a, an educational institution. The event also helps the local economy as many businesses showed off their wares. Learn about agriculture but also to wind in all the uh, local industries, local farmers and also many businesses. And it's not just for those from off the land, 75% of visitors this weekend are city slickers. It's a good day out, regardless if you've got a farm or whatever. There's lots of things here for people who just have a backyard or a home. French student Steve Sacco was keen to experience the Aussie way of roughing it, showing how to boil a billy. It seems like you're watching the others more than, than yourself. <laughs> yeah, because they don't know how to do it. <laughs> but it was just like another day at the office for Patterson's Michael Taylor. The crowds flock to see the ham handicap with some of the fastest pig trotters in the land vying for top honours. But fun and games aside, the event helps highlight an industry that's so important but sees its fair share of hardship. It can be a bit tough in agriculture but it always comes good and uh, it was dry a few months ago and now we've got some uh, plenty of green grass. So uh, they're the ebbs and flows of Australian agriculture. Michael Kane, NBN News. A kidney infection cost him a bout in March and a potential place on the Anthony Mundine undercard in April. 
But Chad Bennett doesn't have any regrets, despite admitting there was a time he thought he'd never fight again. I've been treated, medication, and I'm feeling the best I've ever felt in the probably the last 10 years. And uh, everything's going good, my weight's going great, my training's going excellent. So it's been a blessing in disguise. Despite the health scare, Bennett's next opponent is likely to be one of the toughest of his career. A Peruvian fighter named Tony Fernandez with a record of 36 wins and no losses. These are the fights that you need to get to the next level. And um, yeah, I mean, Tony's earned his stripes, that's for sure. And he doesn't know how to lose, so he's coming here very confident. And um, it's, it's my job to show him his first loss. Hollywood also has a message for the fans who feel let down after he withdrew from the fight in March. Show a bit of faith and, and a bit of belief in me and they come along and support me, I'll, I'll make it up to them by putting on a, a world-class performance on, on the 23rd. In addition to Bennett's return to the ring, the undercard will also feature the first heavyweight world title bout ever held in the Hunter. Mitchell Hughes, NBN News. El Fuego coming up from Sydney. It is the Australian mile record holder, even though the derby's over a mile and a half. It ran 151.3. Uh, Saloon Passage coming over from Bathurst. It's won four of its last five. Uh, so there's some strong contenders in there, but yeah, the one will be the hardest to beat, bling it on. Despite surrendering top spot in the competition, Hamilton isn't dwelling on the loss to Weston. It rained the whole game and we had, a, we had a few blokes out as well, So, but they're always a tough side, they're tough up there. And I probably thought a draw was a fair result, we just, you know, they clung on and credit to them for, for doing so. With the likes of regular first graders Clayton Poole and James Money set to return, Olympic take on a Jaffa side that's yet to find its best form. Former striker John Majorowski may also have a point to prove. It's not, not hard to get up for the big game, so... Um, Johnny Madge coming back here will add a bit of spice, so that'll, that'll be a bit of fun. In the real NRL, tomorrow's clash between Curry and Cessnock will double as a community day. Both clubs will raise money to support the families of Phil Grant and Jamie Mitchell, killed in a mine collapse at Paxton last month. It's this man's alleged donations that saw the state's police minister, Mike Gallagher, stand down from his job this week. 
It has this Port Stephens Labor candidate now asking what relationship BuildEv executive Darren Williams has with Port Stephens Council. Our community would dearly love to see the ICAC light shone a little bit further north. Questions need to be asked on behalf of our community as to the relationship between Darren Williams, BuildEv, Nathan Tinkler and our council. And it's this $18 million Woolworths complex in Madawi that's come into question. When we've still, when we've got the last job standing on BuildEv's books on our patch, our community deserves to know why that's the case. Three weeks ago, it was revealed that BuildEv and its construction arm Balkum staff weren't getting paid on time. Today, the site's foreman was keen to move our camera on. As far as this Port Stephens councillor is concerned, the accusation of alleged corruption is nonsense. I don't think Port Stephens Council have got anything to hide. There are a couple of decisions that have been made regarding anything that uh, Nathan Tinkler's mob's got anything to do with have been very positive. Buildev was unavailable for comment today. Michael Kane, NBN News. Proud unionists marched, united by their pride and anger towards Liberal governments. This year's May Day March was of particular eminence given the sheer number of train-related and manufacturing job losses throughout the Hunter. UGL and Downer EDI have both been forced to drastically downsize their workforces. Since the Liberals took over, there's been 120 job losses each day, including Sundays and public holidays, so that's a really significant number. Um, we can measure the number of job losses, but we can't measure the effect on the community that, that that's had, you know, the workers and their families. Today's march, a clear call for both action and help from state and federal governments. We have a situation where we could lose 4,000 uh, uh, jobs in the Hunter in the next 18 months. Now that's just a catastrophic, uh, that, that's more workers being lost than when BHP actually closed. So we will continue to fight, continue to struggle, and that's what today's about. Celebrating the past, but working hard for the future. Madeline McKell, NBN News. It's about turning something uh, pretty tragic into um, something as positive as we can, like, um, like the Headspace Day and the, the fundraising for that, and also remembering Nick. Having ridden three winners at Musselbrook yesterday, Robert Thompson was just one victory away from the magic mark of 4,000 heading into today's meeting. With just two rides, the odds were stacked against him. Even he wasn't confident about the chances of his first mount lay down the law. The six-year-old gelding started as second favourite. Heading down the home straight, the pair found some room. From there, history beckoned. As with so many of his winners, Thompson seemed to conjure up something special at the right moment. The legendary hoop returned to the winner's circle, receiving a hero's welcome.
as everybody knows. I come from Cessnock, but Newcastle's in my backyard too and all that, and um, it's been a wonderful place always to ride here, and, it's, uh, and I'm very proud and, um, to be able to ride my 4,000 winners here at Newcastle. Emotion spilled over as Thompson talked about his father, whose dying wish was for his son to ride 4,000 winners. Unfortunately, he's not here today. I wish he was, but um, um, it's nearly 12 months since he's passed away, and uh, he's been with me all the way, and he'd be very proud. Unfortunately for his rivals, Thompson isn't contemplating retirement. Mudgy tomorrow and Crindy on Monday and back here on Tuesday, so it's my job and I love it. The Hawks went into the game undefeated, but there was gold at the end of the rainbow for Merriweather at Passmore Oval. A penalty put the Greens in front 23-11 early in the second half. Hamilton set about reducing the margin when Rob Smith set up Tom Blomley to get the home side back into the contest. Frustration began to show for the home side as Merriweather's defence proved tough to crack. Hamilton's next try was one of the best of the game. A win against the feed at the scrum was followed by quick hands before Sorelli Bainavalu finished off. But a pair of unsuccessful conversions left the Hawks trailing. In response, the Greens produced a great try of their own. Spreading the ball along the back line, eventually it was Adam Nolan who gave Merriweather a seven-point gap. Smith did his best to get Hamilton back into the contest, but poor ball handling let the Hawks down. In the dying stages, Hamilton was its own worst enemy as Merriweather hung on. It's a volunteer firefighting organisation that swings into action whenever it's needed, at times risking it all. Because that's who we're here for, we're here for our community. Tomorrow the Madawi RFS headquarters will be a hive of activity for St Florence Day, a time to honour firefighters killed or injured in the line of duty.
It was started in 1999 by a female volunteer in Victoria after the tragic loss of five lives in the Linton wildfire late 1998. We always feel very, um, very sad and, and it's a tragi tragedy. Uh, we're like a big family. Um, we're fairly close-knit and no matter whether you knew the person or not, we're all part of the same organisation. We Even with winter on our doorstep, there's still no downtime for these rural firefighters, training and studying new procedures to stay on top of their game. For 16-year-old Chantelle Cousins, joining the service is all about helping her community. I just really wanted to be a helping hand in my community and I wanted to promote that youth can actually join the fire service and it's not just an older people organisation. Commemorations and activities will start at noon tomorrow. Michael Kane, NBN News. Newcastle has come a long way, shop after shop after shop, um, with nothing in it five years ago. Now Renew Newcastle is celebrating its five year anniversary by taking a look through the photo albums. I think people are surprised to be reminded of how things have, have changed. While the street has undergone a massive transformation, it's the pending redevelopment which will eventually force all of these shops out. It's a bit of a scary future for us in a way because we do want more people to come into the mall and be involved um, in Newcastle but does that mean that our local artisans and local artists uh, don't get to share their work with the community? Plans for the landmark redevelopment by GPT and Urban Growth are currently on exhibition, seeking approval for building heights and land use. And the old DJ's building is a key site in the $600 million proposal. We feel like there's a, still a role for Renew Newcastle to play because we're working in these transitional spaces. It's about temporary solutions. It's about keeping positive activity in the city centre while this transition and while these changes go ahead. Artists hope they can still have a stage outside the prominent building. Newcastle has so many spaces, so many little nooks and crannies and corners and old gorgeous buildings um, that I, I think we really, we have enough potential to remain. Georgina Smythe, NBN News. Great atmosphere out there today. It's just wonderful. The community of Newcastle, the running community of Newcastle, have really got together to make a difference in the lives of, of these boys. I'm just so proud. Very proud day today. Having lost Joe Wheelhouse to a shoulder injury early on, Lampton responded through Peter McPherson. The home side didn't take long to hit back. Pat Brown's shot was well saved by Danny Ireland, but Matthew Swan was there to follow up. Shortly before the break, the Jaffers were reduced to 10 men when Adrian Perisic received a second yellow. Riley McNaughton went close to providing a lift for Lampton. Olympics started well in the second half, Cody Lucas going close. But it was the Jaffers who hit the front, thanks to former Newcastle Jet, Cale Bradbury. 
Hamilton should have been level, but Dave Hodgson blew his chance in front. Then, with the last kick of the game, Swan became the hero, earning Olympic a precious point. At Broadmeadow, the Magic was looking to kickstart its season, Chris Berlin with an early chance. Hakan Khan Lee forced Gunners keeper Michael Stafford into a decent save. Even reigning player of the year Peter Haynes wasn't his usual magical self. Those misses would prove costly as South Cardiff earned a penalty. James Burns put the visitors on track for all three points. Our cameras were shown years of neglect and then a promise for three new stations that two years later is coming back to haunt the state government. For the first time in many, many years, we're actually going to have the cops there first. The projects were said to be shovel ready, but Belmont's still standing, so is a rundown Toronto and the unmanned Morissette. And only eight of the promised $21 million for all three is there. It's very clear that we're not going to get the project delivered in the way in which it was initially promised. Amid a cost blowout, plans for a new police headquarters at Belmont are approved, but a construction company still hasn't been chosen. The project now won't be completed by the 2015 state election. The member for Swansea today met with the Parliamentary Secretary for Police to discuss the delay, and that's not all. Police were told about six weeks ago that once construction starts, general duties officers would come here to Charlestown while special ops would go to Swansea, meaning that station would remain unmanned. Greg Piper says he's been given a commitment around $7 million will be spent upgrading Toronto while $2 million has been put aside for Morissette. Morissette in particular, that hasn't seen permanent police down there for a long time. They want to see them down there. There's also a plan to base state transit officers there to police the region's trains. But for now, it's new police stations as promised that MPs and the police want. I've actually asked the... Um, the, the Premier went in his role as former role as Treasurer to look at this in the upcoming budget. Nat Wallace, NBN News.
It's not Hollywood, but Dungog sure does punch above its weight in film circles. The tiny town can attract a star or two. But last year at least, it looked like the days of the much-heralded Dungog Film Festival were over due to lack of cash and booking issues. But now it's back with a new name and new attractions. At the heart of it, we have a film program, a party program and a food and wine appreciation program. We have some markets, we have um, camping and open air cinema. Like the previous festival, the centrepiece of the new event will be Australian and international movies. But this time around, it's more of a community event designed to showcase the entire town. And it is assured of funding thanks to a three-year state government commitment. We're looking for this festival to contribute $3.6 million in visitor overnight expenditure to the economy locally and to the economy of the state. We're beginning in the first year with what we know to do and what we know how to do best, but the idea is to inspire people in 2014 to make 2015 and 2016 even bigger. The festival will run from the 28th to the 31st of August. Kate Haberfield, NBN News. It's a stunning surf spot any time, but today, Merriweather was magic. Solid swell from the intense low in the south whipped up three metre waves. Fresh offshore winds kept conditions clean, a magnet for die-hard surfers. Only the fittest and most experienced could handle the tricky paddle out from second and third reef. But the reward was there for those willing to take it on. So how was it out there? Uh, pretty hectic, <laughs> that's all I could say. Good fun, yeah. Yeah, I got absolutely smashed. There was an easier way for those with connections. Dave Rowland's jet ski in high demand for tow-ins. Uh, it's, yeah, great fun. It's really big, it's come from south. And it wasn't just wave riders enjoying the day. Sightseers lined walkways to take in the spectacle. It is fantastic. We're from Adelaide, so, <laughs> ah. so if you haven't seen this before. A perfect Monday morning, exhilarating but exhausting. And I'm worn out now, so it's time for a coffee. <laughs> time for a lunch? What time is it? Lunch time or? It was, just about. Today was the peak of this system, but there will be more good swell later in the week. Having a great time. <laughs> Catch us later. For those always waiting for the next big wave. It's the leading cause of death for young people in Australia, youth suicide. Tomorrow night we take a look at how the death of two Newcastle boys propelled a community into breaking down the barriers around mental health. That's tomorrow night. With so many Newcastle players involved in representative fixtures, it was a skeleton crew at training today. Kurt Gidley says the bye helped him deal with a few niggling injuries. Probably my, my quad was the main thing. You know, I haven't been goal kicking because I, I had a little quad strain that's probably been hanging around for a month or so. So I think that was the best thing for me, having a bit of time off, doing a little bit of physio. and It's, it's the best I've felt this morning in a long time. Despite reportedly leading the race for the hooking role with the Blues, Gidley believes he has room for improvement 
And with just two games before another bye, he's keen to kickstart Newcastle's season rather than focus on origin. It's a good thing focusing on two games, certainly this, this game coming up at home and, um, against the Panthers. It's a, it's a really important game for us to get our season back on track and you know, we definitely need to go two from two in this little box. The skipper was still happy to talk up the Blues aspirations of Jared Mullen following his effort for country. I thought he controlled the game really well. I thought his defence was probably his best part of his game. You know, he went a long way to, to, to push in his claims for, for New South Wales. It's already been a big year for Aaron Royal, but there's plenty more to come. Having qualified for the Commonwealth Games last September, Royal officially became a member of the Australian team two weeks ago on the Gold Coast. Yeah, up until that point, it sort of didn't feel real yet. You know, I was the only one on the team, but now with, the, with my teammates, um, you know, it's starting to feel real. The former under-23 world champion has high hopes for Glasgow. I've got the individual race, which um, now I'll be looking to try and get a medal. And then there's uh, a new concept this, this Commonwealth Games with the teams relay. And uh, I think the, the Australians have got a really good shot of um, you know, probably you know, going close to winning it. Based in Wollongong this week, Royal is spending quality time with family in the Hunter, but still making time for training. Having finished third in Auckland and sixth in Cape Town, the 24-year-old is looking to maintain his third place ranking in the ITU World Series when it moves to Japan on May 18. I think I'm roughly around about that sort of area at the moment. I've, I've been improving from the previous years where I was more like 10th to 12th and now I've sort of improved, which is nice to see.
Neighbours say through the week it's a dwelling that sits dormant, but on weekends it's a totally different story. Naked women serving drinks. You can't go out and talk sensible to people who are intoxicated. For the last 10 years, Ross Valair says weekends have posed a problem. Next door had to shield their granddaughters by going out their own back door so they wouldn't see the nudity across the road. Advertised online, the selling point for this short-term rental is that it can accommodate 16 people. Lake Macquarie compliance officers are monitoring the situation, but it seems the solution isn't coming anytime soon. With the likes of party houses locally, I think it's very much up to council to look at regulating the amount of people that can come to these places. The industry is self-regulating um, and where the industry won't take action itself, then uh, you know it's left to council to pick up that burden. That's cold comfort for residents as another weekend approaches. Michael Kane, NBN News. Fire trucks roll into the Orica site. Headed for the site of a nitric acid leak that if not contained could be both dangerous to the 250 workers on site and neighbouring communities. Due to it reacting with something else would have formed a NOx cloud and NOx cloud is not something you want people to breathe in. Working quickly, firemen isolate the leak, spray it with water and rescue someone in trouble. Yes, that is a dummy and yes, thankfully, this was all a drill and a bid to try and turn around the community's perception of Orica following several real-life leaks. We've done a tremendous amount to try and um, reduce concerns in the community by um, acting on, on things we know the community wants us to do and I think we've been pretty successful at that. The annual exercise coincided with a letterbox drop, telling residents not to be concerned if they hear the plant's alarm unless it's accompanied by the strong odour of ammonia. In that case, the advice is... Going indoors, switching off their air conditioning and waiting for emergency services to contact them. Kate Haberfield, NBN News. Two weeks on from his final round of radiation therapy, today saw the next stage in Mark Hughes's cancer battle. Together with his former teammates and biggest supporters, he launched the Mark Hughes Foundation to raise money for brain cancer research. And I knew that I had to make a difference for all the sufferers out there and for myself as well. So um, it, was a night, it was an easy fit for me. The Knight's great was diagnosed 10 months ago and underwent surgery to remove a tumour from his brain. Feeling really good. I have some scans in a week or so, but indications are that everything's positive and I can look forward to getting into life. And helping an area of cancer research that's been largely underfunded. The long-term goal would be to establish a professorship in this domain. Uh, it's underfunded. We need to highlight more research in this area and Mark's foundation will help us to, to reach that goal. I'm very convinced about that. Even before its official launch, the funds were pouring in. Today was also a chance to thank those who've got the ball rolling. I've played football for the Newcastle Knights and that's how most people know me. But I'm hoping over time they'll probably know me more for the Mark Hughes Foundation and for someone that's made a difference and that's, that's now our goal. And with a number of high profile fundraisers on the agenda, there shouldn't be any problems with that. Christy Reading, NBN News. Nicholas Evans was a normal 19-year-old who loved his family, friends and footy before he tragically took his own life in 2013. Came out of nowhere, we are all out the night before so we were all with him. Um, yeah, and just, just sent a massive shockwave through everyone. Just 12 months later, his best mate Aidan Lane took his life too. Pretty much a year later, same thing, so that was just, you know, unbelievable and still can't, yeah, still can't uh, believe it. It was like losing Nick all over again. For family and friends, the loss of the boys has been immeasurable, but they're determined their deaths won't be in vain. 
A Memorial Day at a local footy match last weekend, supported by Mental Health Foundation Headspace, helps keep the memory of the boys alive and the message of well-being centre stage. There's so many things we can do, there's footy games and we have like memorials for their birthdays and things like that. Um, and yeah, just it's good to, rather than just sort of not talk about it and not do things for it, it's good to sort of get together and commemorate them. Friends and family will run the city to surf in the boys' name later this year. They've raised $20,000 and counting for Beyond Blue. Much of the support came within 10 days of Aidan's funeral. It just went crazy. Uh, after the first night we'd raised $2,000 and that was just in a few hours when everyone should have been asleep. For those affected by the deaths, the project gives them an opportunity to channel their grief into something positive. I think people felt like they needed to help in some way, especially in the early days. So um, yeah, it's, it's one of those things that people are desperate to, to find out more information and help these young people you know, seek some help. And for those at Headspace, the more people talk about mental health, the better. One of the um, lovely changes over the last 10 years have been young people aware of um, mental health issues themselves and, and aware of the need to seek out support if they need it. And the internet is playing an important role in the grieving process. Nick and Aidan's friends still write on their Facebook wall. I've had people message me on Facebook and things like that saying, you know, you, you guys are so strong, you know, you've helped me through it just because you guys have got through it. This tight-knit group of friends are happy to front the local movement and spread the message to their peers. You know, you've got to talk to someone, just you have to be open with people. As much as you don't want to talk to people, you have to get it out there. And Everyone's getting a broader understanding about it, so it's good to talk about it. It's good to see all the boys coming together again. They've all got to stick together. Tomorrow night, we take a look at how the move to community-based campaigns are helping break down the stigmas around youth suicide and mental health. Georgina Smythe, NBN News. For Phil Stubbins, a head coaching job in the A-League is a dream come true. You know, it was a pretty surreal sort of moment, to be honest, to, to finally get, you know, somebody to give us the faith and the confidence to to be given the opportunity. I wasn't born in Madrid or Barcelona or Milan or one of those exciting vocations. I'm from Hull in the north of England. Um, so my background's a hard working one. Despite speculation, Graham Arnold was the Jets' first choice. CEO Robbie Middleby says no offer was made. We did meet with Graham Arnold a couple of occasions, but the whole time Phil was a standout and um, someone that we believe is the right fit for Newcastle. Stubbins is now hoping to emulate the success of the Raw, Wanderers and Mariners by establishing a new club culture. We could do with some improvement in leadership area. Um, I don't really want to sugarcoat it any other way but to say bluntly that we need to improve in a few areas. Um, not so much in, in a technical aspect but between the years and get ourselves stronger. Unlike some of his predecessors, the former Adelaide assistant is happy to adapt his tactics. Ultimately, getting back to the finals is the priority. We'll start by putting things in place where we want the result first. Um, and then if we can play in an open, expansive manner, we'll do that. If it means we need to play in another way with a different formation, we'll do that as well. The new boss is yet to meet the players, but he's hoping the likes of Adam Taggart, Josh Berlante and Mark Birrigitti will stick around for another season, despite attracting overseas interest. Stubbins is also looking to bring in fresh faces, especially in the front third. Mitchell Hughes, NBN News. Playing for Fiji, Corbin Sims produced one of the hits of the season. But it was this challenge that caught the eye of match officials. Sims needs his high tackle charge downgraded at the judiciary in order to face the Panthers on Sunday. With Newcastle's resources up front already stretched, the return of Newcastle's country representatives was a welcome sight today. Tyrone and, and Robbie had really good games on the weekend. I think they'll take a lot out of the weekend and uh, especially coming back to club football, take a lot of confidence into this weekend. I really valued the game, um, you know, for my own experience and for obviously the country towns. Um, I believe Dubbo got a lot out of it. Robbie Rocco wasn't keen to talk up his chances of being picked for New South Wales, but Jake Mamo is still buzzing following his performance for the Blues under 20s. Definitely unexpected. I don't think you ever expect to get a man in the match on the wing, really. It's usually reserved for a half or 
one of the forwards, but I was definitely happy with my game and happy with the entire week and how it all went. With Akila Uate returning from injury, Mamo is likely to get a well-earned weekend off. The 19-year-old Central Coast junior knows it's all part of the journey to first grade. I don't feel I'm completely there yet, but that's where I want to be and I'm on my way there, so I'm enjoying it at the moment. I'm looking forward to this to this trip as well, Michael. So um, hopefully they'll they'll do well. And South America is an unknown territory, and I haven't been there before. So you've got to go there looking your best, don't you? And we're looking at people who have funny turns, which means you know, they get dizzy, lightheaded, falling over, fainting, and we don't know 100% why. Uh, we can put this in the patient, and most of the time we get an answer. The search for the missing rock fisherman has been called off for this evening, with water police and the Westpac rescue helicopter unable to find him. The 43-year-old was fishing off rocks near Boat Beach with two other men at around 12.30 this afternoon when they were swept into the ocean by a large wave. A 34-year-old man was rescued by a local surf life saver on a jet ski while a 39-year-old man managed to swim to rocks where he was winched to safety. Both have been transported to Manning Base Hospital with minor injuries. It's believed the men who were holidaying in the area from Goulburn were not wearing life jackets at the time. It's yet another um, uh, rock fishing um, uh, disaster where three people are swept off the rocks. Um, obviously, whenever these things happen, we have to remind people of the dangers of rock fishing and the need to uh, wear proper protective equipment. And if you don't have that equipment, then don't fish off the rocks. The search for the missing man will begin at first light tomorrow. It's considered a popular party drug and police are under no illusions about its prevalence in Newcastle. But right now, more than ever, officers are worried about the use of ecstasy. There's a bad bunch of ecstasy that's made its way onto the streets in Newcastle at the moment and um, it's causing us some concern and uh, certainly causing the ambulance a reasonable amount of work. Ecstasy is also known as MDMA and is both a stimulant and a hallucinogen. Police say there's no way to visually identify which pills are in the so-called bad batch. These drugs are produced in, in very unhygienic um, circumstances on most occasions and uh, unfortunately every now and again we have people that have a bad reaction to it. According to the health department, those bad reactions can be brought on by any number of factors. From what's in the pills, to how much users take, their height and weight, what mood they're in and past experience with ecstasy. 
The department warns bad reactions can happen to anyone and can include very high blood pressure, a fast heartbeat, fits, vomiting, hallucinations and even death from heart failure. Police have issued a blanket warning against using the illegal drug. Certainly uh, at the moment it, it's, it's akin to, to rolling the dice, just how you're going to respond to what's out there. Madeline McKell, NBN News. According to the New South Wales Bureau of Crime Statistics, an average of 94 domestic violence assaults were reported every day in the last 12 months. Jan McDonald from Carrie's Place at Maitland helps more than 200 women in the Lower Hunter a week. She says it's time to shine a light on the problem. When are we going to start talking it up as the one, one of the number one things that we hear about every day? That's, that's the key message I have for our leaders in our community. She admits some progress is being made in terms of awareness. More and more people know that we exist as a service to provide support. It also means that women are able to identify that the relationship they're living in isn't an, a, a respectful or a safe relationship. But Ms McDonald says more services are needed to adequately support victims. The demand for the services Carrie's Place provides is such that 8 out of 10 requests for assistance can't be met and they could be for anything from help with accommodation to legal advice. And it's not just services for women that are in high demand. Philip Penfold has been running Hunter Valley Men's Crisis Support for more than two years. He says some clients are also victims of domestic violence. Men feel like they're... Um if they're a victim of violence, they're not necessarily catered for. And I, I do think that's more than perception. I do think it's a reality and um, it's something that we need to fix for the future. Vivian Von Drainen, NBN News. Some of it should be held. Now, if that's uh, Hunter Infrastructure uh, Investment Fund, then uh, that's fine as long as the, uh, the, the mechanism for distribution from that is looked at. From head, are you enjoying today? Absolutely. How does it feel? Fantastic. To toe, today was all about putting aside the big C for some pampering. I was diagnosed with breast cancer, an aggressive breast cancer in November, and I've had two surgeries and I've almost done six months of chemotherapy. Um, still got six weeks to go and then I've got to have six weeks of radiotherapy. Um, yeah, it's just knocked me around. I just feel like I've been run over by a steam train. So is today a nice change? Yeah. For Met Pearson, today also marked a milestone. This was met at last year's event in the fight of her life after being diagnosed with ovarian cancer. 
Now, 12 months on since her last chemotherapy treatment, she was helping to give those with cancer the relaxing experience she once had. I'm not the bald one here today and there are so many more beautiful ladies that are gone bald today, ditch the scarves, ditch the wigs and come out and actually just been comfortable being who they are. Every person goes away with a smile on their face. And with the event in its 10th year, there was a moment to remember a staunch supporter, Tony Tamplin. Tony has spoken at the Bald and the Beautiful every year since it first commenced in 2005 and it was absolutely one of the highlights of his year. So I thought I'd come and stand in his place today. Emma Murphy, NBN News.